Um, so, all right, let's get started. So, Bill, thank you, first of all. Let me get to the right slide here. Um, so thank you so much uh, for being willing to do this program um, and for all of your support of the University Archives over time. First of all, let's start off with how did you decide to write this book? Okay, well, it, this book came out of uh, the research I did for the book that the slide shows there, OSU in the 60s. And in writing that book, I went through all the lanterns and all the Macchios and saw a lot of stuff that I thought was either funny or interesting or bizarre. And I just didn't have room for it in this book or it was un inappropriate for the theme. And I saw especially a lot of photos that I thought would be of interest. So that was really the genesis for the second book. Great. So the first book was kind of serious. The second book's for fun. And you put them together. It's like a two volume set that people That's right. have. <laughs> Can't have one without the other. So obviously the second book is all about student culture and student life. When you think about Ohio State versus other Big Ten schools, were we different? Were we the same? What were things like in the 60s here versus at other universities? Well, I think for in, in comparison to the other Big Ten schools, it's pretty similar. I think the interesting difference that creates a lot of the opportunity for fun here is the size of OSU and some of our Big Ten counterparts, which is represented in, in this picture from the May Week Supper. So what it created was a critical mass of young, uh, fun-seeking people. And with that critical mass, there are a lot of things you could do uh, in terms of flash crowds, in terms of concerts, in terms of stuff that would have an impact. And just a combination of numbers and discretionary income, we'll talk more about that later, I guess, but uh, really created a lot of the energy behind the changes and a lot of the fun parts of the 60s. Do you remember, so you said this picture is from the May Supper. Do you remember what year this is? I think it'd be 64, 65. Okay, so right in the middle of everything. Looks like, is that French Field House? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and the, the fact the university could feed that many people that quickly. Right. <laughs> so in parts of the book, you talk about a hostile takeover of pop culture um, for the students of the 60s. What did you mean by that? Well, by takeover, I mean that it kind of dominated pop culture. And by hostile, I mean my parents' generation weren't really very approving of it. But I think the reason it happened anyway in the great American tradition of uh, entertainment follows the money, you had this huge group of baby boomers who someone once described as like a pig through a python coming of age at the same time. And they also had for the most part in the upper middle and upper income people discretionary money and the entertainment industry would chase that. And they found the best way to chase that was to find artists that people of that age related to. So it'd be younger artists than currently were in charge, be like uh, the Beatles and some of the younger filmmakers as represented here in Easy Rider. The other thing I would mention, that's, that's in part why that slides up here, in the text, we don't have time to, to deal with it uh, today, but in the text itself, I've excerpted from a wonderful column by a Lantern reporter named Gail Bryce, who took her parents to see Easy Rider. And her reaction to their reaction, I think, is, is priceless. And uh, I would encourage everybody uh, who has a chance to read it. And the, the University Theater, is that, that's not still there. Uh, no, I'm trying to remember what is there in its place. Yeah, the University Theater in the state. I think the state is the one that came the Agora. I forget what happened to the University Theater. But you're right, it's not there. So one of the things you and I talked a little bit about um, as we we're getting ready for this webinar was that um, in the book and, and, you know, I think it's something that people would recognize is that there's very little evidence of people of color in the first dozen or so um, parts of, you know, first part of the year of the 60s um, in terms of the photos that we have. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then as you reflect on the students during the 1960s at Ohio State, what were the differences that you saw during your research in student life based on um, race and for people of color? Okay. Well, I think it's fair to say that um, 
African Americans were kind of treated as an in insignificant minority. There weren't very many at Ohio State. There are no numbers. Nobody actually kept track of it. But we know from the census that African Americans were about 8% of the state's population then, and probably only 1% or 2% of the university population. Um, but the one place or two places where you would see black faces is number one in athletics. Woody Hayes in particular was known for opening up opportunities. And the, the picture there is the famous number 42, Paul Warfield, who went on to the Football Hall of Fame. So you'd see black faces there. You'd also see them in, and they're in the book, in entertainment, people like Louis Armstrong and so forth who came forward. But other than that, you really didn't see many until the university opened up after the results of the civil rights movement later in the decade. Uh, the other thing I would mention, this has race implications, but isn't totally race related, is the people we're showing having fun are people that could be on campus and have time to have fun. There are a lot of students who had to work one job or two and didn't necessarily have the opportunity to do this. So it's important to remember, although this is for fun, there were social and uh, cultural implications off that. In terms of, uh, I think your other question was how students in this period were different. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, part of it was there were more of them. And part of it was, and I remember people telling me this as I was growing up, our teachers would tell us, you know, we were the biggest generation ever. We were the best educated ever. We would be the, we grew up in a period of prosperity. Great things were expected of us. And I think as a result, we had a collective generational chip on our shoulder that we were entitled then if we worked hard and did the right things to have a good time. And then that later grew into a sense of, well, you, we're not, you are not entitled, you the older generation, to tell us what to do. We're entitled to live our own lives. And how that came a lot of the social conflict in the 60s. So it's a fascinating period. Well, we're up to our first audience participation. Right. Uh, so please remember to use the chat function. And Bill, I'm gonna let you set this okay. up. We promised we would do this. Okay, this is a picture from the Lantern in the spring of 1961. And what the Lantern would do back then is show a picture of what appropriate dress is for class, but for women only. Men apparently were assumed that they would do the right thing. So in this particular picture, Two of these women are appropriately dressed for class and two are not. And when a woman showed up in class not appropriately dressed, the faculty was encouraged not to let her attend class. Uh, now, most of the people complied voluntarily, but uh, it certainly seems quaint, if not uh, overly re repressive, looking back on it. So this one should be an easy one for our audience, but let's see what happens. Because tomorrow you and I both recall, we show this to undergraduates today, a picture similar to this, and they're stumped because they can't figure out what possibly could be wrong with the way these people are dressed. But so two of these women are dressed appropriately and two are not, so let's let our audience, so what should they do? Respond in the chat thing or what? Put it in the chat. Which ones okay. do you think were appropriate? Okay. So we get, we... Yeah, they're getting them. Oh, it's unanimous. <laughs> you have to wear a dress to class. Shorts and even modest slacks are not appropriate. You know, what amuses me to no end is that these are very conservatively dressed people. By the end of the 60s, those would be totally out of style. Anyone dressed that way would be overdressed. Okay, you want to go to the next one? Yeah, let's go to the next one. Okay, this one will be a little trickier. Okay, so someone here, or some ones here, not following all the university rules. Now, it's tricky. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push one obvious answer off. You cannot say having a man or woman in your dorm room, and I believe this picture, because I know some of the people in this picture, was from Bradley Hall. So it's legal to have a person of the opposite sex in your dorm room during what's called an open open house. So that's, what's, that's not what's wrong with this picture. Yet there is a rule that these folks are violating. Let's see if people guess it. Okay, they're getting weird. These people are smart, yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay, four on the floor is obviously being violated by the couple on the top. 
Now they look pretty innocent anyway, at least in the picture. But the rule was in an open house, you had to have the door open so you could be checked and you had to have four on the floor. And that also applied to the lobbies of the men's and women's dorms. Although there were lobbies that were notorious for loose enforcement of the four on the floor rule. And the four on the floor means four feet on the floor. <laughs> so you had to be pretty creative if you were gonna follow the rule and still do whatever else. Okay, well, we got a pretty sophisticated group here. There you go. But a lot of them probably lived through this. Okay, this one. What is this fine piece of apparel called? Where's the dorm mother? <laughs> All right, yep. Those of you, and there are probably some of you had one of these, this monstrosity is called a Nehru jacket and was actually named after the Prime Minister of India who actually wore them. And of course, a lot of Indian and Oriental stuff was very much in the mix of social culture. This fortunately had a brief career, but there were a lot of people that had Nehru jackets. I would have to confess I did not have one. Okay, what's the next one? All right, so so we are uh, we're gonna switch now. There's more audience participation in a little while, so everyone hold your horses. But um, so one of the the three of the big events you talk about throughout the book are Homecoming, Greek Week, and May Week, and obviously they changed dramatically from 1960 to 1970. So what was the most interesting thing that you learned during your research about those changes? Um, well, my favorite, and I, I did write about it, was what I would call the cultural war over the entertainment for homecoming. And the cultural war was between, I would say, the more traditional people that were on traditions board, and they took literally that name and brought more traditional acts, and some of the more progressive folks that wanted to see rock bands and some of the others. So that back and forth. And there's a, there's a picture of the book that I love of somebody on the traditional side hanging lantern columnist Stuart Mech in effigy because he dared to criticize the homecoming entertainment. So that's, that's a good one. Uh, another interesting one for me was that ROTC, Ohio State had the biggest ROTC um, contingent in the country in the mid 60s. But because of all the protests and harassment, it got moved off the Oval and stayed off the Oval for 20 years. But it came back, I think, in 95 or something like that. And I remember I was there watching when they brought ROTC back to the Oval. And I thought to myself, if this were the 60s, I probably would have been joining people protesting ROTC on the Oval. But now I'm a little older and have a broader view of things. I think it's good that they came back. The other thing I would mention, uh, a couple things that the traditions that did not make it reflect the difference in the way women are treated. So the old um, uh, gold diggers dance where women were to invite men just lost popularity. The Women's Self-Government Association um, bridal fair also got dinged. And uh, so there, there were some, some other cultural changes as well. I would also add, it's fascinating which traditions have thrived. And the big one is the marching band and OSU football. They're stronger than ever, even though we're dealing with some issues right now in the pandemic. Now, is this, is this picture from homecoming, you think? Or is it from May, May week? This, I believe, is from homecoming. I love the cars, too. It's one of the great ways that archivists uh, identify the age of photographs is, is by looking at the cars. Yeah. Who cared about mileage per gallon? <laughs> Those were the good old days. And I have a couple of things in there, stuff people did, took for granted, and it was really polluting or bad for your health. <laughs> so one of the other questions that I posed to Bill beforehand was uh, some of his favorite photographs. So we're gonna show a few of those and, and Bill can tell the stories about them. Yeah, you'll see this one on the cover. This is a toga party pyramid. And I think it's my favorite of all of them. And I think the thing that, that I love about this picture is this, these people are obviously having a good time. And the word I would use to describe it is exuberance. And if somebody knows who any of these folks are, because it's from the Macchio, but they didn't identify who they are. It's from about 1963 or so. 
it'd be great to find out. And I'm looking, my favorite out of all of them is the woman in the upper, would be up your right hand corner as you look at it. She's just totally having a ball. In fact, the whole top tier of the pyramid is having fun. So that's number one. Number two would be in the same, you know, in the other, go back to number one in a minute. Sorry. The other sad thing is students today couldn't do this right now under, shouldn't do it under COVID. So it's a kind of a reminder that uh, in some ways it was nice to be able to do that kind of thing and not have to worry about it. Hopefully someday we'll be back there again. Okay, let's go to the second picture. I will just point out, perhaps my favorite is the student below her on the bottom who looks like he's about to fall. <laughs> yeah, those guys <laughs> have a lot of weight on that poor guy. This is a favorite, again, for a similar reason of exuberance. She's obviously having a good time. And there's a lot in the book about dances and dance steps and all that. And uh, this one kind of uh, uh, summarizes it. Well, the other thing about this one is that it is in color. And that is one thing that yeah. you know, a lot of the photos, because of the, the Macchio and the lantern just at the time didn't, you know, color was expensive. So it wasn't producing it. There were some, but not much, not much in color. So I think this next one is more of a, your favorite story. Oh yeah, I just love this. Itself. Right, so this is a picture from the concert by the New Christie Minstrels. It was called The Big Hoot. And what it was was a hoot nanny. It was the first con pop concert held in St. John Arena. And this would have been in February 21st of 1964. That date's important, I'll get back to it in a minute. Um, and it was called, a hoot nanny is where folk singers come in and then the uh, audience sits around them on the floor. And so what they did in St. John is they had the new Christy Minstrels on the floor and students sitting around them and also up in the, the balconies as well. And they were encouraged to sing along. Um, I found out about this when I was a freshman, <coughs> which was in the fall of 64, because there was a picture of the big oot in my dates and data. And uh, I, I was a big fan of the New Christie Minstrels. I wished I could have been there and wondered about what the concert was like. And finally, when the Lantern went out of line, I got to read the Lantern stories and, and interviews about it. It was a big deal at the time. The New Christie Minstrels were very popular on TV. It was a real feather in the hat of OSU to get them to show up for that concert. And the concert sold out. Um, the interesting thing, when I mentioned the date of February 21st, so that was kind of the peak of the folk song movement. On February 9th, just two weeks before that, the Beatles first appeared on Ed Sullivan. And by the time spring came around, folk singers were still around, but they were passe. And, and the English invasion and all that was really popular and kind of wiped that out. The new Christie Minstrels continued to play and have some popularity, but nothing close to what they had. Now, the fascinating thing about this is who was on that stage that evening and what happened to them. One of them is the guy in the center there. His name is Barry McGuire. He was the lead singer for the New Christie Minstrels. He left the band shortly after that. That would have been, in, again, in 64. About a year and a half later, he had recorded a song called The Eve of Destruction which ended up being number one on the charts and is a classic protest song of the 60s, old enough to kill but not for voting and all the other stuff. Also on the stage that night with the new Christie Minstrels was a guy named Larry Ramos who played the banjo. He quit the Minstrels and went out to California and joined a kind of soft rock group called the Association. And about two years after that, they released Along Comes Mary and then Cherish the classic soft rock love song of the 60s. So that's out of the New Christie Minstrels. But there was another group on the stage that night that was a warm-up band called the Journeymen. There was three folk singers. One of them was a guy by the name of John Phillips. Two years later, a song he had written and recorded with a group called the Mamas and Papas called California Dreaming broke nationally and became the folk rock classic of the 60s. Also on the stage with the journeyman was a gentleman by the name of Scott McKenzie, who then wrote and later recorded, If You're Going to San Francisco, Wear a Flower in Your Hair, which became the voice of the summer of love in the spring of 1967. So an incredible, I, I always ask myself, boy, is that a wish you could have been there event? 
knowing what you know now? And the answer is absolutely. So all four of those people were on the St. John's stage right here at Ohio State University in February of 1964. So I, I just had a lot of fun telling the story behind that picture. It's, it's wonderful how a, a photo like that can go get you to look at the lan the old lantern, which for those of you that don't know, we, um, thanks to Bill, when he was still vice president of business and finance, starting us out, but the entire lantern is digitized and searchable online through the archives website, um, as well as the yearbook. So um, it's nice to be able to start with a photo and then go back and see how it was covered and think about what happened to people oh, yeah. over time. And the, the lantern uh, reviews are interesting. In some cases, the reviewer is really right on and gets it, and in some cases, they don't have a clue. <laughs> That's what makes the lantern, if, what we used to call the learning lab, it would be like a uh, chemistry lab, sometimes the reaction works and sometimes it blows up. <laughs> well, it's all in what you see, right? Yeah, that's right. All right, so we have, uh, we are now set for our next set of uh, some audience participation. Now this is a little bit different. This is gonna be a poll and um, Shannon Niemeyer, who's helping us out put this uh, webinar together, is going to launch it for you guys. Hopefully, if the technology works right. There yeah, we go. All right. Yeah. So which of these 60s night spots is your favorite? And then we'll be able to see the results in just a second. Oh, lots of people answering this one, Bill. Pardon? There's lots of people. <laughs> in their two cents on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the comments are coming so quickly, I don't have time to read them all. But is there a way we can look at these afterwards? We will. We will. Okay. All right. So let's see, Shannon, what we got here. Oh. Oh, the Varsity Club. Varsity Club's the winner. So do you want to say anything about these four? Yeah, and the interesting the thing about the Varsity Club that I found out from reading the Leonard coverage of it is when it opened, and that ad there is the first ad the Varsity Club ran when it opened, and I think it was February of 1960 or something like that, that it started out not as a sports bar, but as a bar that deliberately catered to graduate students and older students. It was more serious. Mm -hmm. And back then, um, if you were under 21 but over 18 you could drink beer but only 3.2 percent so by limiting the beer to six percent only they kept out all the undergraduate riffraff so the varsity club which is still with us today uh had it start that way and then also of course it it encouraged people from the basketball games in particular but again was for more serious students faculty and alumni over 21 one of the things I very much enjoy about the book is looking at some of the ways that High Street and some of the in, of some of the businesses have changed over time too, oh, which you yeah. also included. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's see what our next poll is. I can get it to work. All right, Shannon, let's put let's uh, post this poll. And we can see what people which movie people like the best. Wow, that, my comment on that is that is the one I would expect would have won because it most uh, captures the era, uh, particularly, particularly that scene where uh, uh, the, the older guy says to Dustin Hoff and he pulls him aside and says, there's one word I want you to remember. What's that, sir? Plastics. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much in that movie, but all these movies are great. The other thing I did in the book, which I think, because my background's in economics, I think you'll have fun with, is priced out what some of this stuff costs then as to what it would translate to now. And actually, movies were relatively expensive back then, particularly Dr. Zhivago, 
when it uh, premiered at Hunt Cine Stage. And I actually took my girlfriend there when it happened. And to me, it was worth worth the extra dough to prove to her how how much of it. And it was such a wonderful movie. I mean, all these movies are wonderful. Movies. I think that would show you what you were worth, right? Would, yes, you right. You would go to? Time to step up. Yeah, all right, exactly. this, this will be fun. All right, so one last poll. Which of these is your favorite couple? <laughs> this one people are taking some uh, some time to really think yeah, about this it. This is what I, I have no idea how this is going to come out. <laughs> Well, number B. Ah, all right. You know, if you were to ask me my favorite, it is because to me, they're the epitome of the hippie dippy couple. I mean, they're, they're just grooving and they're happy. And, they're, you know, he's got the buttons on and uh, it's, it's a cool couple. Again, if anybody knows who they are, uh, that would be great to find out. They are not identified in the Macchio. I think one of the interesting things about this picture in the Macchio is I don't know if y'all can see the line in the middle between the two, but it's actually in between. It's on. It's a big spread. It goes over two pages, um, and so they're they're kind of on opposite pages, even though it's the same photograph. So, but you know, but tomorrow, my reaction to that would be the Macchio apparently thought this was a good picture to give it the full. Yeah, you know, two pages, and I think they're and the Macchio photographers took wonderful. There's just so many wonderful pictures, and I, I think when I, whenever this pandemic's over, and I get out and around talking about the book, one of the things I want to do with the audiences is introduce some other pictures that didn't make it into the book for uh, either quality reasons or space reasons, because there there's some wonderful ones as well. But these photos really, really capture the spirit of the moment. Exactly. Wait a minute. There's some, did you see that comment? Jane Sorry, Miller and all. I should have ended the lamp. Oh, Jane, we have to talk to you later. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, congratulations. You did the picture. Very nice. Oh, this is so much fun. That's great. All right. Now, Bill, you did want to just mention oh, Wendell yeah. Ellenwood today. Okay. Uh, this book went to print, uh, I think, in February. It was just about the time Wendell Allenwood died. And I had a chance later when the book came back to print something that I could add small things. And had I been thinking, I would have dedicated the book to him. Because to me, he represents um, the good things about OSU and what the administration tried to do. Uh, and he truly was a member of the greatest generation. Those of you that know him, no, he was a field artillery forward observer during the Battle of the Bulge. So he's one of those people that went to Europe, uh, put everything on the line to help defeat a, a real scourge in terms of uh, Nazism, came back, started working in student affairs, and really uh, uh, had always students foremost in his mind. I always thought the Ohio Union in Ohio State was, was really one of the best student unions in the country because of him. And sadly, he's passed away. So even though I, I missed the opportunity to do it in print, I wanted to do a virtual dedication of this book to Wendell Allen. And Wendell, thank you for everything you've done. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, well, yeah. we've gotten to the point, and Bill picked this picture. So I, I had nothing to do with it. I'm just letting go. <laughs> But we did, we are at the point where we're uh, going to ask some questions. So we did have a couple people who wrote um, in ahead of time. So we'll start with their question and then we'll go to the, the Q&A. Um, so, Bill, the first question was, um, when this person was a freshman uh, at Ohio State in 1965, women had hours, but men did not. And for some reason, women could stay out an extra hour on Wednesdays, which was known as midweeks and became an evening for socializing. So his question is, when did, where did this midweek phenomenon come from? And was it something that the university administration just did? 
or was it requested by student government? Okay. Um, first of all, the, the questioner is, is correct. Uh, women had hours, men didn't, and there was this Wednesday blip you could come in at midnight instead of 11. When I saw the question yesterday, I went back, and I don't remember any controversy about it, and see if I could find any record of when that was added. I could find, because I had a list of all the changes that were made in the 60s, and that wasn't one of them. Uh, so I think it was baked into the system when the decade started. It wasn't an issue by itself. What was interesting though, because the second question was, was the administration take the lead or the students? The administration back then loved to say this was a regulation the students were placing on themselves. And there was an outfit called the Women's Self-Government Association, which elected what they called a standards chairman for every dorm and roomy house or sorority, and that they would enforce these rules. In the first half of the decade, it would be organizations outside of WSGA, like the Student Senate and some of the more activist students that would press WSGA to make changes and WSGA would resist and the administration could say, well, the students don't really want this. In the middle of the decade, WSGA's position evolved and they became more supportive of changing some of these rules and the administration went along with it. I think they thought it was inevitable, uh, but they did try and slow it down a little bit. But by the end of the decade, all these rules were gone, which is a, just a fascinating uh, study in social change. It is one of the, we do have rules and regulations along with the women's handbook in the archives. Yeah. <laughs> you um, gotta read it. It's they are, uh, so uh, th those are on my list. They're not, they're not available uh, digitally right now, but it's on my list of things I'd love one of these days to digitize because I think people would find them very interesting to compare the rules and regulations, but then also the women's handbook, uh, which was called About Buckeye Coeds, uh, and it was done by the um, Women's Self-Government Association. So it's on my list. It's, we're not there yet, but uh, it's on my list. Uh, so the next question um, that, all, that came in for us ahead of time was, um, that Bill, uh, he uh, wanted to know about the, that you've written another book, um, regarding the university in the 60s, which we talked about, but also um, your book, Soldiering in, On in a Dying War, which were your insights into the Vietnam War. Um, and so his, the question is, as a Vietnam combat veteran, did this current book research add any additional observations regarding Ohio State college students and their feelings or beliefs regarding Vietnam during this period? The book itself didn't because it's not about it, but leading up to it, it did. And uh, uh, this is a question that was sent in earlier too. As I thought about it, we could spend a whole hour talking about all those relationships, which we won't. But I will say two things. One is uh, I'm coming up next month on October 15th will be the 50th anniversary of when I left for Vietnam. And I'd been in Germany before then, then came for leave for a month in the United States. And what I remember what struck me at the time and it kind of frustrated me and made me angry is that here I was going to risk my life and limb. The country was going on like, you know, people were still going to the mall, they were watching TV, there were weddings, everybody, it was like, don't you people know there's a war on? That, so I kind of left with that. I've since kind of gotten over that. Part of what I realized when you think about this, and this is where it ties in then to this current book, between 1964 and 1968, I was at OSU doing a lot of things that are pictured there. Mm -hmm. And thanks to a student deferment, I was able to get a first class education, a college degree, fall in love more than once, and have a great time of my life, just like that book recalls. And during that same period, 40,000 young men like me lost their lives in Vietnam. Now, is it my fault? No. Uh, is there something unjust about it? Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, that, so that kind of ties together in, in that way. Um, so I, at this point, I think I'll just leave it at that and say that the person who raised that question, oh, I'm sorry, there's one other thing I'd want to say. If you go back to the other book, the more serious book about OSU in the 60s, there's a lot in there about ROTC, about students supporting the war, students opposing a war. So there was a lot of activism on the campus. It was hard to generate a majority 
for anything at any given point of time, but there was really a lot going on. And OSU was kind of at the epicenter of it in many ways, because this really was middle America. And at the beginning of the war, middle America supported the war. At the end of the period, the end of the 60s, middle America wanted out of the war. And I think that's reflected as to what happened here. Thank you. So I'm gonna go to our Q and A. Um, and I apologize for looking, I have multiple screens going, so if you all are wondering why I'm looking at different. Um, so the first question uh, is, um, in the student days, so this, this is obviously from some, I know you said a lot of people you know are, on, are were planning to attend today, right, but this and I don't trust doesn't know you, me. obviously. So um, they want to know, in student days, were you active, were you active in activities, politics, journalism, sort of what were your student activities during when uh, you were in Ohio State? Well, my roommate, who had a, a way with words, called me an activities major. Uh, and it started, I think I, I applied for and got into Freshman Center. And that usually was the springboard for people to get involved in campus politics. So uh, I ended up uh, getting, I ran for Student Senate and uh as a freshman and lost pretty pretty convincingly but then got involved a guy by the name of Vic Frost recruited me into the men's residence hall association where we had worked to combine the men's and women's halls into one co-ed organization called the South Campus Student Association and I ran for president for that and was elected and uh, spent two years very heavily involved in that so I think it's safe to say I was an activities major to some degree. Um, and the other, uh, I had some involvement with Student Center a little bit, and I also did a little bit of work on Robert Kennedy's campaign in 1968. So that would, that would kind of be my undergraduate uh, uh, record in terms of what I did. <laughs> I also tried to be a serious student, but that, that wasn't always easy. Well, you know. <laughs> Um, so someone would like uh, you to describe in loco parentis. I'm, I'm sorry, say that again? Sure, sorry, I, I said it too quickly. Uh, someone would like you to describe in loco parentis. Oh, in loco parentis is a Latin term that means in the place of parents. So at the beginning of the decade, the standard assumption at all universities was when parents sent their children to a university, it was the university's responsibility then to take the role of parents and keep the students out of trouble. Um, and the, the classic example of that is women's hours. Uh, it was a curfew on women, but not on men. The rationale for that, by the way, was because people did question it. Why are you locking up women, but not men? Well, if we keep the women locked up, the men can't get into trouble was the rationalization. Uh, that concept got challenged both by students directly but also in the courts. And I had one, an OSU administrator from that period tell me that they were responding both to student pressure, but they also knew in the long run, legally, they weren't going to make that hold. So by the end of the decade, the local parentis was pretty much out the window. Mm -hmm. But boy, at the beginning of the decade, it was pretty heavily accepted. The, when, uh, when I talked to one of Tamar's classes that has undergraduates in it every year and describe some of these rules and the rules that, that they really just can't believe. There's a rule called the apartment rule, which said if you were a woman, not a man, you couldn't go unescorted into a man's apartment unless you had a university approved chaperone. And if you got caught, you got thrown out of school. The other rule called the hotel motel rule said that if you were a woman, not a man, you couldn't go to a hotel or motel within 20 miles of a 20 mile radius of campus without your parents approval and if you got caught you got thrown out wonderful wonderful rules <laughs> well there there are two things here one's asking about that university theater we were talking about and um someone says that they believe it was owned by uh leo yasinov and became a sub sandwich shop it has oh, the football okay. player based on Chick Harley on it. So that's that's where it was okay. in case anybody is looking looking for it. Um, so the next question is, who was responsible for enforcing rules like four on the floor in the dorms? 
Oh, well, this is, this is great, one of the great contradictions. What the administration would say is that the students were responsible for enforcing their own rules. So that's why he had this structure called the Women's Self-Government Association. So in every, uh, every dorm or rooming house or sorority, they would elect a uh, standards person, chairman or whatever it was, and then they would have a standards committee. So let's say, if, for example, you signed out and you got back late, so you missed curfew by 10 minutes. Well, you would accumulate late minutes, and if you got more than, I think, 20 or 30 late minutes in a quarter, then you would come up before standards committee, and standards committee could do all kinds of horrible things like ground you and, and uh, take away your, they couldn't throw you out of school. That, that took, that got kicked up to an administrator. But it was supposed to be self-enforcing. And as you might imagine, as the decade went on, it became harder and harder to self-enforce. You also have, I didn't write about this in the, this book, but I wrote about it in the OSU in the 60s book. There's all kinds of back and forth between the co-ed student government bodies and the WSGA about who is really speaking for women. And the, the co-ed student bodies would say, oh, WSGA is just a bunch of old fuddy-duddies who never go out on a date and therefore want everyone else to be miserable. That was the attack they would do on them. The attack WSGA would do on the co-ed bodies is, oh, it's just the men wanting to get advantage over women and it's not really representative of women. So you had a lot of that back and forth as the decade went on. <coughs> A lot of competing questions, a lot of competing uh, interests, I suppose, right? Yeah, they were. But this business of late minutes, uh, I think you could find pretty funny because, you, again, you wouldn't want to accumulate too many of these or then you get grounded and then you can't have any fun. <laughs> so there are a couple questions about um, some of the sort of anti-war demonstrations and that kind of thing uh, in terms of whether or not that's in this book. And, and I know those are really in the first book. So uh -huh. I, I would encourage people to take a look at, at Bill's first book um, in terms of that. Um, here's a question. Can you tell everyone about the band Four O'Clock Balloon? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. There were, um, in the psychedelic area, which, era, which would be 67, 68, the campus band for psychedelic type movie was the four o'clock balloon and i remember uh they <laughs> now you mentioned this they did a concert along with a psychedelic light show at the world theater one evening and i i said i had to go so i went i think i had the law boards it was my senior year and i had the law boards the next day and i didn't care i wanted to go to this concert and uh it was on the other side of campus and we got back, it got started late, and my girlfriend at the time got late minutes because we got back late from the four o'clock balloon. <laughs> Fortunately, she didn't get grounded. <laughs> but uh, it, it, they were just, I'm trying to remember, they did some original songs. They also did the one I remember is Caterpillar. I'm a Caterpillar, which I think was a, I told was a Led Zeppelin song. And there's a little bit about them. The members, they were OSU students. So I guess that's the other important thing. Uh, and the alumni magazine did a follow-up on them, I think, when they did a feature on 1968. So they were the, if, if you wanted to be cool in 1967, 68, you were a fan of the Four O'Clock Balloon. They, oh, they also opened, get this, they opened for Jimi Hendrix when he played downtown at Vets Memorial. I am also told that after that concert, Jimi Hendrix came up the campus and attended a party. And I was talking to somebody who was at the party and said, Hendrix was really cool. <laughs> Those were the days. Well, so there you go. Gosh. Um, somebody's asking about when did the student affairs positions, like the Dean of Men and Dean of Women, move to the single, uh, which is now our Vice President for Student Affairs? Oh, that's a good question. And in fact, I wrote about that some in the first book. I think it was around 1966 or so. And then the Dean of Women, Christine Conway, and the Dean of Men, Mylon Ross, were both retiring. So the university used that to their credit as an opportunity to put the two offices together. And so um, Ruth Weimer, who was the Assistant Dean of Women, 
became the dean for all programming, I think it was, and then Milt Overholt, who was the assistant dean for men's housing, became the dean for all housing. And then I think Ruth Weimer was gonna be promoted to be the dean of students, but that's when she and John Mount got married, and that would mean that she reported to John Mount and the university didn't want to have spouses reporting to each other. So she stepped down. I think John Mount was the overall Dean of Student Affairs there for a while. But OSU was among the leaders in the Big Ten and universities elsewhere in combining the old Dean of Women's Office and the old Dean of Men's Office into an Office of Student Affairs. That reminds me, I, I, it reminds you one thing when the question came up about who enforces the rules the mm -hmm. students do. Every room in a residence hall also had what they called a resident advisor, who was an upper class student, but was paid by the university. And ultimately they were responsible also for making sure things didn't get too out of hand on their respective floors. <laughs> Somebody wants to know, uh, uh, did you ever participate in the Greek week bed races? <laughs> did I participate? No, although I did watch them. <laughs> um, just looking, I want to make sure that we have a time for um, uh, to give away your book and then also I'm going to let people know that Bill uh, has some time at the end of this so we will stay on for a little bit after this um, but I do want to let me just before we'll, we'll get back to more Q&A but let's let's just I, again I want to make sure we're we're paying attention to time in case people need to go. So let's see if we can figure out. So Bill has generously uh, signed two copies of his book that we're going to mail to our two winners. Um, Bill and I both picked numbers just randomly over the number of participants we have today. Um, aha! So you see here in the chat, the winners are Thomas Workman and Rachel Barbash. Uh, so thank you both. I will be uh, send you an email once we're done and get the best address uh, to send you copies of the book. So they'll come from the university archives um, in some sort of manila envelope. So if you're wondering what is coming to you from the university, now you now you know. Yeah, don't so, throw it away. <laughs> yeah, don't throw it away. Exactly. So great, thank you. Um, so. Again, if people do do have a hard cut off at four, I want to make sure um, to put this up. This is how um, Gramercy Books is is partnering with Bill for um, book sales. Book sales do uh, the author proceeds are benefiting and supporting the university archives. So um, similar to his first book on the, the university in the 1960s, for which we greatly appreciate. Um, but I will see how many participated today, huh? Well, what do I got here? Well, right now we still have 162 people. Oh, 185. Thank you, Q. Um, so that's what we've got so far. But I'm going to go back. Uh, so if you do have to leave, thank you for coming. We greatly appreciate it. Now, if you want to stay on, Bill, I'm going to go back to the questions for a few minutes. If you sure. if Let me you say one thing. before. Let me also thank Absolutely. everybody for participating. And uh, secondly, that if you want a signed copy, I pre-signed some copies for Gramercy Books over in Bexley. So they have them and you can either pick them up in person or they'll mail them to you. Great, fantastic. Um, and I do see a note in the chat that um, you, somebody would have uh, wanted to have seen this. We are, like I mentioned, we did record this. Um, and so we will have a copy of the, um, an email uh, will go out soon with a link to that recording, so please feel free to share that um, with, to, with as many people as you want. We like to we like to share the uh, share the love after the event as well. So, um, all right, Bill. Let's see. Now, some of these have to do with your first book, but I'm going to ask them to you okay. anyway. Um, photos of anti-war demonstrations. That's really your first book. Mm -hmm. What about? No, he's, uh, the person's just asking if there are any photos. Oh, not, yeah. Not absolutely. in this one. Yeah, but there are in the first book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, the um, first OSU book, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, also, I think in the first book, but uh, you want to talk about why the football team did not go to the Rose Bowl in 1961? 
Yeah, that's a classic. And the, the prelude to that, this because this is a classic Woody Hayes, the university uh, football team did okay, but not really well in 1960. And the criticism of Woody Hayes was that he, he was old and out of touch and didn't know how to use halfbacks in a modern way. So you go into the 60-61, uh, I'm sorry, the 61 season, and it's like Woody Hayes says, <laughs> halfbacks, you want halfbacks? I'll give you halfbacks. So enter Paul Warfield, for future football Hall of Famer, although as a, as a wide receiver, and Matt Snell, who later ended up playing pros for the uh, New York Jets. So you had two outstanding halfbacks added to a, a fullback. I can't remember his first name, Johnson. Somebody will remind me to it. But I, I, when I read that in his entire career at OSU, he was never thrown for a loss, I, to me, it's just incredible. So that was Woody Hayes's. Uh, three yard, three yards of three yards of dust, and <laughs> off you go. So anyway, so this team in in '61 really started to gel. I think they had a tie at the beginning of the year, but they were undefeated, and they were. The question was, all right, you're going to, and they beat Michigan. I mean, they they handled them. So the question is, well, you're going to go to the Rose Bowl. The problem was there was not a contract between OSU and the Rose Bowl at that time, because. OSU and some of the other Big Ten schools were fighting with the people that organized the uh, Rose Bowl over money. There's a surprise. And so they, they, as a result, they didn't have a contract. So that meant for OSU to go to the Rose Bowl, the faculty council would have to, yeah, I just saw a chat that was Bob Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Roger, for uh, uh, correcting that. My old memory sometimes doesn't work. So anyway, with uh, the Ferguson, those two uh, uh, wonderful halfbacks, Woody's team uh, got an invitation to the Rose Bowl, but it had to be approved by the faculty council because there was no contract and the Big Ten rules required that. So it first went to the athletics committee, which approved it, and then to faculty council. And there had been some back and forth about whether the football tail was wagging the academic dog and I've talked to some of the faculty members that were involved back then. There was also some resentment on the part of the faculty that they thought the university administration was high handed to them in general. And so when it came up for a vote, it was voted on by a secret ballot and it was voted down. So in other words, I cannot imagine this happening in today's environment, but the university turned down the Rose Bowl bid. So there was a big uproar, as you might expect. One of the people who tried to calm it down to his credit was Woody Hayes, who said, uh, he, he said, you should never criticize the faculty. You have a right to make that decision. Although he took his um, frustration out on Jack Fullen, who was the head of the Alumni Association then, and was one of the cheerleaders for not going to the Rose Bowl. So that went back and forth. So anyway, uh, OSU couldn't go. And uh, the, the irony of this is among the universities that did not have a contract with the Rose Bowl because they were supporting OSU's position was the University of Minnesota. Well, they were next on the list based on their when they'd been to the Rose Bowl last and their record. And so they got the invitation OSU didn't. And guess what they decided to do? Screw you guys, we're going to the Rose Bowl. That was, the, I think, the last time Minnesota went, so they got a hex of their own. They may have, in fact, won that year. Um, the other blowback was that a lot of other university, uh, our Big Ten comrades, would then go into Ohio and recruit football players by saying, OSU is not serious about football. Look at what they did. And it took a while for Woody to overcome that. But he did, and then you had that great team in uh, 68. So it's a fascinating story. Uh, there was also blowback to the Alumni Association, which at that time would elect um, presidents from the membership. And there was a slate put up to throw Jack Fullen out. And they actually, uh, half of the alumni board was up in 1961, and the uh, protest slate won. It came up then for the second half in 62 and the Jack Fullen slate won. So it was kind of a, a standoff and, and the uh, Jack Fullen finally retired a couple of years later. But uh, it, it's stuff, 
you imagine stuff now like it was back then where the university turned down a Rose Bowl invita invitation. Now it wouldn't because there's a contract. And where the alumni, the head of the Alumni Association got in the middle of a campus controversy is hard to imagine. And that was when the Alumni Association was separate. So that also- Yeah, there's a whole description of all that stuff in, in the uh, OSU in the 60s book. Yeah. Um, well, I'm trying to see. So for some of you that may not have, are, that are still on that might not have uh, had your question answered, um, we will, we do have all of your emails and we will get back to you. Um, and, uh, as long as Bill, I guess I'm answering for Bill. Bill will get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tamara. Uh, there's no problem. Um, with some, some answers uh, to some of your questions. Because um, some of these things, like I said, really do connect more to your first book. Um, yeah. So I'm just, um, I'm just, oh, Jeff Schwartz is asking why you didn't discuss your activities as a participant in the free speech picketing, so. <laughs> well, that story is probably worth telling. Yeah, I forgot. Uh -huh. Well, I had mentioned I was, uh, got recruited into the Men's Residence Hall Association by Vic Frost and got elected secretary because no one else wanted to run for it. So he was president, I was secretary, and the men's residence hall during the controversy over the free speech rule in the spring of 1965 took a stand against the speaker's rule. So that was out there. Meanwhile, the university was talking about enforcing the dorm rule that required freshmen and sophomores to live in the dorm. And those of us in dorm government didn't want that enforced because we didn't want people living there, didn't want to be there. So Vic Frost had set up a meeting with the Dean of Students then, who was John Bonner, uh, for us to go talk to him about the dorm rule, not about the free speech stuff. So as we're walking over, it turns out that's when the, the thing blew up and there were pickets walking around the administration building, faculty and, st and students picketing against the speaker's rule. And Vic, as we were waiting, as we we're getting ready to go in, Vic said, you know, we had to go around just a couple of times to show our support. So I said, sure. So we did. So Vic and I walked with the pickets around the administration building a couple of times, then went in the building to meet with Dean Bonner. Now, as irony would have it, the office Dean Bonner had was the first one when you go in the Bricker Hall to your right that overlooks the Oval. As irony would have it, it's the office I later occupied as Vice President for Business and Finance 50 years later. But at the time, of course, who knew that was going to happen? So we go in the office, and, and Bonner had a huge map of the world on uh, one side of his office and then the windows on the other side. So we walk in and he greets us and he, he points to the pickets outside his window walking around the building. And he said, I'm really glad to be meeting with responsible student leaders like the two of you instead of that riffraff outside. <laughs> It's a good thing he wasn't looking out his window to see you. Yeah, I see it was. Maybe he did, maybe he was. <laughs> maybe he was making that comment. And there was, of course, we all joke because the administration loved to use this term responsible student leaders. And what they meant by that are student leaders that agreed with them as opposed to student leaders that created trouble. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, um, Bill, there is somebody who wants the name. Oh. Shannon already ans asked, answered that uh, with the name of the first book. So we have that there. Um, I'm going to take this one question before we let people go. Um, someone said they toured the archives many years ago. And is that option still available? Well, we would love it to be. Um, but right now in the situation we're in, we are not offering tours. Um, hopefully, um, Maybe next fall, things will have settled down uh, with the pandemic and we can go back. We certainly do love having people at the archives. You, we, do, we are taking um, some appointments to do research. Um, so if you're interested in doing research, we, we are allowing that um, with limited hours. Um, but in terms of tours, unfortunately, can't do that right now, but it'll come back. I promise it. I promise it'll come back. So. But with that, thank you all so very much um, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We will be emailing you soon with the link um, to, the, uh, to today's recording. Um, and if you didn't get your question answered, we're, we have saved those and we will be working on that as well. We really, really appreciate it. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. Oh. Bye. <laughs>